Thank you so much, uh, Ben. And I also want to uh, thank all of you for joining us for this webinar, which is entitled Giving Honor, a Key to Fruitful Cross-Cultural Partnerships. Uh, ben just mentioned the, uh, the Vision, Zin Vision Synergy Summit uh, that was held this past May in Chiang Mai, Thailand. And uh, one of the uh, workshops uh, uh, I was able to uh, uh, facilitate uh, was about this uh, particular uh, subject. And um, it's the first time I actually taught about uh, this theme of giving honor uh, in order to facilitate uh, unity and fruitfulness in the body of Christ. And I found as we uh, shared in, uh, in this workshop, uh, there were there were s several people from other nations there. Uh, of course, Vision Synergy uh, does great work in bringing together network leaders from all over the world. But I discovered that there were uh, some pretty significant emotional uh, issues, honor issues, uh, people feeling marginalized. Uh, we kind of gave voice to some of the concerns uh, that some people have about um, working across levels of honor status in the World Christian Movement and in mission networks. And so uh, I thought this, it would, this uh, particular webinar would be good to expand on some of the things that we covered, uh, uh, first of all, in that Vision Synergy workshop this past May. So let's uh, move right ahead uh, in our material today. We're gonna take a problem solution approach in this in this webinar, we're going to look at the, the problem, first of all, uh, which in our material consists of two parts, rivalry in the New Testament world. We'll see that honor competition and rivalry was a major part of the culture of the New Testament world. And then we will also examine uh, rivalry today. We're going to ask, what does rivalry and honor competition look like in networks or cross-cultural cross partnerships today? And then we'll look at some uh, material concerning solutions. We will uh, see that being like Jesus means uh, giving honor. We'll discover that Jesus and Paul teach that serving and giving honor undermine rivalry and honor competition. And then we'll examine what uh, giving honor may look like today in our own mission teams and networks and cross-cultural partnerships. And uh, we will propose that it looks a lot like empathic listening. So let's move forward. Uh, let's look at the problem of rivalry in the New Testament world. We will see, as already stated, that honor competition and rivalry was a major cultural feature of the New Testament world. And uh, here I have a, uh, a photograph uh, taken from two uh, mixed martial arts uh, fighters. And uh, it's, a, it's a bit humorous maybe for some of us, but it represents honor competition. And while uh, this may uh, uh, look a bit humorous to us or maybe over-dramatized in the American entertainment uh, arena, uh, this kind of rivalry was actually quite significant in the Roman Empire. Really, honor competition is part of the default culture of the Roman Empire. So, for example, love of honor was uh, a feature of the, of the culture. The, there's even a Greek word for it, philotimia, and scholars uh, uh, who have written about the Roman Empire and its culture have uh, conclusively demonstrated that honor, love of honor, honor competition was what held uh, the Roman Empire together. And uh, authors like Aristotle and uh, others have, have written about the love of honor being so central to the world of the ancient Near East and the Middle East. And we see this reflected in scripture. Uh, here in Mark chapter 10, uh, we see uh, James and John coming to Jesus and saying, uh, 
what can we we want you to do something for us and jesus says to them what do you want me to do for you and they said to him grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory uh, this seems like a really ostentatious uh, uh, request on the part of these two disciples but in the culture of uh, the ancient Near East and the Roman Empire, this love of honor was just part of the way people thought about things. And, and James and John were trying to display that, were displaying that here in their request uh, for Jesus. Then we have the dynamic uh, which scholars call challenge and repost. It's the social game of push and shove. And repost is a fencing term that means uh, a quick thrust uh, in, a, in a fencing competition. And uh, socially, it means a clever reply. And so this social game of push and shove was played on the street uh, of the ancient Near East and the Roman Empire, and it's still a part of that culture today. And uh, we see here again in, in uh, the Gospels, in Mark chapter 9, uh, the disciples came uh, with Jesus to Capernaum, when he was in the, uh, in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. We can just imagine the, the disciples challenging with one another and jousting with, what, with one another socially uh, uh, to challenge one another concerning their honor. And then there's another dynamic called the image of limited good. It's the belief that everything of value, respect, land, money, uh, honor, was in short supply. So if I gain, then uh, someone else in my community uh, by default loses. It's the belief that everything is, is uh, of, value, of value is limited. And... Um, one scholar writes about it this way, one person's superiority means that another is comparatively demeaned. So these factors all figure into this culture of conflict and competition that was so much a part of the Roman Empire. Then we see this dynamic of boasting, uh, again, a part of the culture of Rome. And here we have an extensive quote from James Barclay and his book, Paul and the Gift. Uh, he writes, Paul lived in a face-to-face -face society where self-advertisement, rivalry, and public competition were a perpetual cause of tension in everyday life. As recent research has em emphasized, almost all social relations in Paul's cultural context were ordered and threatened by the competition for honor. In the absence of objective measures of quality, such as educational qualifications, a person's worth was heavily dependent on his public reputation, a dignity energetically claimed and fiercely defended. The pursuit or defense of honor was uh, as commentators claim, the chief motivating uh, motivation for action. By nature, uh, we yearn and hunger for honor. And once we have glimpsed, as it were, some part of its radiance, there is nothing we are not prepared to bear and suffer in order to secure it. So wrote uh, Cicero. And challenge was indeed the very essence of this culture. Honor was derived from comparison, from oneself uh, or being placed by others higher on some hierarchical scale in which one person's superiority means that another is comparatively demeaned. This made honor ever the subject of contest. Indeed, the ordeal or test was the very arena in which honor was proved. In this environment, every claim to honor was a real or potential provocation, and every challenge required an active repost. Honor was a precious but unstable commodity requiring active promotion and persistent demonstration in a court of opinion that continually looked on with a critical eye. 
James Barclay, tremendous quote there about boasting and honor competition in Rome. Robert Jewett, in his great commentary on the book of Romans, says it is ordinarily overlooked that Rome is the boasting champion of the ancient world, filled with honorific monuments and celebrations of glory, uh, celebrations of imperial glory. And so when we look at the New Testament, we see this word boast quite frequently. Uh, salvation is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Uh, in Galatians, Paul wrote, Far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 2, when Paul is addressing the Jewish community, he says, You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. And in 1 Corinthians 1.31, uh, quoting uh, Jeremiah, I believe, Let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. Uh, actually, in the books of First and Second Corinthians, there are some 30 uses of the word boast, boasting, and so on. You, and so we see how ingrained this dynamic is even in Paul's writing. Now, we do not mean to suggest that in our own Christian networks and partnerships around the world that we have the same degree of boasting, rivalry or honor competition that plagued the New Testament church in the Roman Empire. However, we do mean to convey that by bringing to the surface the issue of honor status and the problem of honor competition in the New Testament church, along with the specific solutions provided by Jesus and Paul, we really can achieve greater unity in our mission teams, networks, and cross-cultural partnerships for greater fruitfulness in God's kingdom. So we've looked at rivalry in the New Testament world. Now let's just briefly consider what rivalry may look like today. What uh, uh, does rivalry or honor co competition look like in networks, mission teams, and cross-cultural partnerships today? Well, here's some suggestions. When we think about rivalry today, the levels of honor status often unstated in the mission team network or partnership may vary according to multiple identity factors. There's the issue of age. Uh, there's the issue of gender. There's the issue of race. Arab, East Asian, South Asian, Anglo-European, African, Latino, Native, Indigenous. There's the issue of tribe, minority tribe versus majority tribe. There's the issue of caste. Uh, untouchables, lower, mid-level, upper caste. And then we can continue. There's the issue of family. If you're from uh, a low family or if you're an orphan, that's quite different in terms of your ascribed honor than, ha than you're, if, if you're from a well-known family. Your economic well-being has much to do with your honor status and your national identity, Western versus Eastern and Global South or American versus any other. And then finally, education. Uh, your educational achievements have a lot to do with one's honor status. Uh, and so these are identity factors. And uh, when we consider what might rivalry look like today, well, these are just some thoughts that I have on it. It can look like possible resentment or cynicism when leaders are chosen based on default cultural val values rather than biblical servanthood or competence. It can mean voices of qualified persons uh, being marginalized in decision making. It can mean doubts about fairness in your uh, team. Who will lead? Who is rewarded? Whose success will be celebrated? So, as we examine these various issues of honor status and how they figure into the issues of rivalry, uh, we shouldn't think of rivalry as a problem that afflicts just some peoples, but not others. Rivalry is a human issue. Well, we see that the top voter vote getter is education. And, uh, we see the next one is age, and uh, then we have issues of gender and national identity and economic well-being, uh, that these are the top five factors uh, 
that you have identified as um, indicators of honor status in uh, in your teams. So, yeah, very good, very good. Well, thank you for responding uh, and bringing to surf to the surface some of these uh, some of these dynamics. Um, so we've done our poll. And uh, we have looked at rivalry in the New Testament world. We have looked a little bit at rivalry today and what that might look like in our own uh, mission teams and networks. So we're going to look at some solution uh, areas now. And we're going to think about being like Jesus and the fact that he was an honor-giving uh, uh, savior. Uh, we're going to consider that Jesus and Paul teach that serving and giving honor undermine rivalry and honor competition. And then we will look at what giving honor uh, looks like in our own mission networks and cross-cultural partnerships. And we're going to think about uh, the practice of empathic listening. So being like Jesus, giving honor, that this is, a, this is core to the solution uh, uh, to the problem of rivalry and honor competition. And um, so here, going back to Mark chapter 10, where James and John said to Jesus, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Uh, blatant display of the love of honor. And by the way, the other disciples were very resentful. It's, it's uh, explicitly stated in the scripture that they were resentful of Jesus, uh, resentful of the disciples for, for asking about this. And let's think about how Jesus responded. Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that the Gentiles who are considered rulers of, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So what is Jesus teaching? Well, one of the things that he is teaching is that great honor is accessible to everyone. Regardless of honor status, gender, age, race or tribe or caste, family background, economic position, nationality or education, every believer can be great in God's kingdom. Every believer can gain honor by being a humble servant in relationship with God. Jesus is democratizing honor. It's kind of a big word there, but it means to make accessible to everyone. Uh, Jesus is making accessible, accessible to everyone the available, availability of honor in the kingdom of God. By knowing Christ, the king, and gaining honor through serving, the problem, therefore, of honor competition and rivalry is undermined. Now, what about Paul? How does Paul address rivalry and honor competition in the body of Christ? He describes the antithesis of rivalry, the opposite of rivalry. He uh, describes what a unified body of Christ looks like, and we're going to be looking at uh, uh, scripture verses from 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12 uh, to see this. So in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, I think we're familiar with this passage. Uh, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker and dispensable, seem to be weaker, are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow or we give the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving 
greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. So here's that key phrase from 1 Corinthians 12, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. And then in Romans 12, remember he's writing to uh, Christians in, in, in the capital of the Roman Empire where honor competition is so uh, prevalent. He says, love one another with brotherly af uh, affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Instead of competing for honor, outdo one another, compete with one another in showing honor. So what principle might we uh, discern from Paul uh, as he uh, talks about unity and fruitfulness in the body of Christ? Well, here's uh, one principle that, that uh, uh, I, I think is, is discernible. Here's how I state it. Unity in the body of Christ happens in proportion to the way the so-called strong and honorable demonstrate honor and respect toward the so-called weak and less honorable. In other words, supernatural unity in the body of Christ happens as we intentionally show honor to those who seem to have less honor in the body of Christ. Giving honor to those who lack it. Isn't that what Jesus did? Of course, as we think about the parable of the prodigal son or Jesus um, ministering to the woman at the well or uh, Jesus uh, healing the woman with the issue of blood, uh, so many stories in the New Testament, Jesus didn't only heal and save people, he elevated their honor, he covered their shame. This is part of the gospel. So being like Jesus, giving honor, this is a core to experiencing unity and overcoming rivalry or honor competition in a mission team. Now let's add a little nuance to this conversation. We do want to acknowledge that levels of honor status in a Christian community or network may indeed vary according to spiritual factors. Notice 1 Timothy 5, 17. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. So it's, it's quite clear. It's not, it's not that we're supposed to have a community, a network, a mission team where there aren't uh, levels of, of honor. Moreover, the Bible does not call us to withhold honor from people who may deserve it according to political, traditional, or cultural standards. Uh, from Romans chapter 13, uh, Paul writes, pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. He's clearly referring there to, to people external to the body of Christ who just are in the culture. And then uh, we see uh, in 1 Peter chapter uh, 2, uh, Peter writes, Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. So uh, I think it's uh, quite plain what... Uh, uh, we're trying to get across here in that, that uh, slide. So coming to uh, the next poll, uh, this is our quick poll number two. We're asking, to what extent does your ministry team, network, or partnership have a culture that values giving honor? And so here you have your five options. All right, thank you for your participation. And uh, we see here that uh, moderate value we're asked is, is the winner. To what extent does your ministry team, network, or partnership have a culture that values giving honor? Uh, only four respondents said very high value. Uh, 
about a fifth of us said high value. And uh, most of us are right there in the middle, moderate value. So thank you for thinking about this. Thank you for responding uh, to this. As, as I think back on our uh, workshop that we did at the Vision Synergy Summit in Chiang Mai uh, this past May, uh, one, of the, one of the dynamics that came to the surface was expressed uh, by a few different majority world network leaders who, who felt frustrated uh, by the fact that they had been uh, either marginalized or had not been given a voice or um, felt in some way or another demeaned by their majority world uh, collaborators or partners. And uh, so, uh, so thank you for, um, thank you for responding to, uh, to this poll. So let's continue on now in our next, uh, excuse me, yeah, as we go, move into the next uh, session, uh, this is a quote from my book. Again, the only kind of honor competition befitting Christians is when they outdo one another in showing honor, referencing Romans 12, 10. Now, I think that there are real challenges to the practice of honoring or of outdoing one another and showing honor, of uh, seeking out the less honorable to honor them. Um, it's, not our, it's not our default uh, socially to do this. Um, and there are obstacles uh, to this practice. There are emotional obstacles. Uh, there are spiritual obstacles, there are cultural issues. I think it's uh, commonly understood that uh, in mission teams around the world, the greatest uh, areas of tension are not in uh, relationships with the, the host culture, but the greatest areas of tension are often uh, within the missionary community itself or within the mission team, the, within the network, within that cross-cultural partnership. And um, so uh, let's, let's think about why that might be. And um, I have a statement here that addresses this issue of, of uh, being able to give honor. I write here, believers are able to more easily give honor to those who lack it when they themselves have shame resilience. And shame resilience comes from a deep awareness of one's own honor in relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ. So this practice of giving honor is not something that, you know, we just have a checklist of we need to add this to our daily checklist. It really flows out of a, a walk with God, a sense of who we are in Christ, a deep sense of affection that we experience from God our Father. And we see this referenced in Scripture uh, in many ways. I'm just going to show a couple of verses here, but in Romans chapter 8, all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Uh, this is not... Uh, uh, talking about gender, this is, of course, talking about honor status. Uh, you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And in John 1, uh, verse 12, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Uh, the gospel writer here, John, is trying to communicate the astounding honor of uh, our uh, of having relationship with God through Jesus Christ. If we take seriously the claims of Scripture, we must conclude that God offers us a surplus 
of regal honor in relationship to our Lord Jesus Christ, which is nothing short of astounding. And out, it's out of this honor surplus that we're able to give honor to others, that we're able to become servants because we're not concerned about defending our own position. We're not concerned about how much honor we need to gain uh, and uh, preserve if we already have more honor than we can, uh, than, than we need. So uh, being like Jesus, uh, having relationship with God, experiencing that honor, and this is what enables us to give honor. Now we also want to uh, think about giving honor today and what this might look like, and we're going to examine uh, listening skills. So what does giving honor look like today in networks or cross-cultural partnerships? Let me just mention, first of all, that on the one hand, giving honor can look quite different in every culture. There are nuances to every uh, tribe, community, language group uh, that uh, honor, uh, giving honor uh, can be very customized and I think that's important to keep in mind. On the other hand, there is a good way to show honor that's common to all cultures. And that common way I refer to as listening. So the practice of listening. Uh, what I wanna do here is I wanna look at five different levels of listening. Uh, the first level is where I only appear to be listening. I'm thinking about something else, actually. My mind and heart are elsewhere, and the person I'm talking to knows it. I think uh, we all have experienced uh, both ends of this. Uh, I know I have. Um, the second level of listening I refer to uh, as listening in order to be heard. I'm thinking about what I will say next. I want to make a good impression but what, by what I say. And uh, I may gain something valuable as a result. You know, when we come together in conferences, a lot of what we do is networking. Uh, and uh, we're thinking about what we may gain uh, from uh, being in relationship to this person or that person. Then there's the level of uh, listening for the information, I call this the third level of listening. I need the knowledge to be effective in my job, family, relationships, or ministry. And the fourth level of listening, I call listening to understand. I listen to understand. I repeat using many of the same words I've just heard from the person I'm talking to, so that the person knows I understand him or her. I want to reflect what the person is thinking. So that's listening, not for the purpose of thinking, what am I gonna say? But I'm listening, thinking, okay, what is, what is that person saying? I'm gonna use some of the same words that they're using as I reply to make sure that they know that I'm listening and I understand them. And then there's what I call the fifth level of listening, I listen to understand with feeling. I interpret what I have heard using my own words and I try to use the appropriate emotion. I want to reflect what the person both thinks and feels. And this we often refer to as empathic listening or listening with your heart. And let me just say, this is powerful um, and it's beautiful and uh, it's it's a discipline that you can develop but it takes real effort this is not something we do naturally the holy spirit is is uh, someone who helps us uh, to listen empathically we know in the scripture, listening is important. Uh, in James chapter 1, let every person be quick to hear, but slow to speak. And uh, 
these uh, listening skills are, are so, so valuable in our mission teams, in our cross-cultural partnerships, in our mission networks. Uh, but I want to now bring this back to uh, the whole practice of giving honor. I believe that empathic listening is quite uh, equivalent to, to giving honor. When we listen empathically to others, we are giving them honor. We're giving them our time, our presence, um, our, our heart and our, 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 our listening ear. But let's take this a step further, and we're going to here examine one more thing before we go to our Q&A time. What if we listen empathically with an honor-shame filter? Here's what I have in mind. If we are familiar with the different honor-shame dynamics, and here on the right you see a a diagram, a circular diagram. I call it the honor shame wheel. This is uh, uh, in, in my book, The Global Gospel. And I show how each of these dynamics, uh, these honor shame dynamics are represented in scripture and also overlap with the gospel. Uh, if we become familiar with these honor shame dynamics, and then uh, what, if, what if we, when we are listening, we are listening with an awareness of honor, shame, uh, for the purpose of understanding possible rivalry and uh, uh, diffusing conflict or avoiding conflict. Here's what uh, uh, I have in mind. What if we asked what honor, shame issue may be involved in the particular rivalry or conflict. And for example, uh, one of, or the first dynamic of honor, shame on, on the honor, shame wheel, the one that's right at the top, it's, it's called the love of honor. And this refers to the fact that every human being has a longing for honor. And in honor, shame cultures, there is a, a, a great uh, uh, recognition that shame is to be avoided, shame is to be covered, and honor is to be longed for and uh, pursued and achieved and preserved. And so if you have a conflict uh, in your mission team, a conflict in your network or your cross-cultural partnership, here are some questions that can be asked. Uh, has someone been insulted? Is there a loss of honor? Uh, does their shame need to be covered, their honor restored? Uh, what about the community? Is the community gaining honor or losing honor? Uh, these are issues that uh, we as Westerners maybe are not uh, very well keyed into as we engage in our cross-cultural ministries. Uh, the second dynamic that we have and the honor shame wheel is called two sources of honor ascribed and achieved. And so uh, there's a question that relates to this particular honor shame dynamic. Uh, it's a question that may be uh, considered uh, if there's a conflict in your uh, uh, network or mission team or partnership, the question is, is there a default cultural standard of ascribed honor based on age, family, or title that conflicts with a standard solely based on achieved honor? So in the West, we, you know, we try to make a, a, uh, all, all uh, promotions are based upon merit. All promotions you know, are based upon uh, achievement. But that may not be appropriate in, in, in uh, non-Western cultures where age, family, title, uh, ascribed honor issues are more uh, respected and prevalent. And, and so this can be a source of conflict. Uh, a third dynamic here we call the image of limited good. It, this is the belief that that everything of value, land, money, respect, honor, uh, 
is in short supply. So if someone gains, by definition, someone else loses, right? And this can uh, contribute significantly to, uh, to conflict. So the question is, has someone in the group gained honor making another person feel demeaned? Uh, is recognition being given fairly? Is the person aggrieved somehow excluded? And uh, so this is just a suggestion that uh, as we listen empathically with an awareness of honor-shame dynamics that we can uh, uh, perhaps hone in on the sources of conflict, the sources of rivalry that we may not otherwise uh, uh, be able to uh, uh, grasp uh, easily. So again, uh, these honor-shame dynamics, uh, they're available to uh, understand uh, through my book, The, the Global Gospel, and um, they can help us in our listening skills. So we have looked at being like Jesus, uh, giving honor as a solution to rivalry, uh, giving honor and serving. We've also looked at what, what uh, giving honor may look like in today's networks or cross-cultural partnerships uh, through the practice of empathic listening. And I want to uh, begin to... Uh, summarized here, and this is my, my final question for our presentation right now. To what extent do you, in your mission team, your network, your cross-cultural partnership, to what extent do you have a culture of giving honor? 